silence your cell phones. Uh, and then you can also join the conversation online with the hashtag JFK Junior Forum Live and interact with our student-run Instagram at JFK Junior Forum for behind-the-scenes highlights. We would also like to thank our co-sponsor, the Fairbanks Center and the Ash Center. And now please take your seats and welcome me, or join me in welcoming our guests, the director of the Ash Center, Professor Tony Sage. Okay. So good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you all for joining us for this extremely important topic. Uh, we're now, to my surprise, into the 15th, almost 16th week uh, of the demonstrations which have been taking place in Hong Kong. And uh, as you know, uh, in 1997, an agreement was made uh, that until 2047, over a 50-year period, we should be operating a system of one country, uh, two systems, which would enable uh, Hong Kong to be able to have certain benefits, certain rights, uh, which were enshrined in those agreements, and many of which were not uh, permissible for those living uh, on the mainland of China. And of course, what has set off the latest round of demonstrations was the proposal for an extradition bill. That seemed to me somewhat benign. Um, and in fact, one of the first cases was going to be to extradite someone from Hong Kong to Taiwan, not to the mainland. And yet, this has set off quite an extraordinary uh, set of events that we've all been following over the last 15, 16 weeks. And yet now we have a situation where that extradition bill has actually been withdrawn. So we're very lucky this evening that we have Victoria Huey uh, with us, who's an associate professor at the University of Notre Dame, and also Jane Perlis is, is also with us, who's a recent uh, New York Times uh, Beijing bureau uh, chief. So let me turn to you first, Victoria. The bill's been withdrawn. So why, what is happening? Why are these demonstrations still going on and why are they actually gaining strength in some ways? Okay, we should understand that the protesters have five demands, so one down, four more to go. The other four... But they um, didn't have all five at the beginning, did they? Well, this is because timing matters, because mm -hmm. originally, if Carrie Lam had agreed to formally withdraw the bill early on, because a million people demonstrated on June 9th, she refused to, to withdraw the bill until, and then on, on Wednesday, June 12th, when the Legislative Council was scheduled to deliberate on the bill, then many people protested and surrounded mm. the electrical building, and then the uh, electrical could not really meet. And on that very, very day, and New York Times actually published this very, these very, very good reports showing evidence of police abuses against mm -hmm. protesters. And that then added the, the, and the second demand, I see. independent investigation into police abuses. And the third demand also on that day, that because the government characterized the protests on that Wednesday as riots, and then people who were charged, then people who were arrested and could be charged for, for, the, for rioting, which would carry a maximum sentence of 10 years. And this is why when Carrie Lam suspended the bill on that Saturday, uh, June 15th, people decided that this is not enough, that the bill has to be formally withdrawn. And so we saw another two mil million people on the street on June 16th. And, and so they added the yeah, so then they added the demand that there should be the dropping the, the rioting charges and also um, uh, uh, dropping the characterization of riot and also investigating into police abuses. So the fifth demand is reopening discussions on universal franchise, mm -hmm. on genuine universal suffrage. Okay, so we've now got, okay, four extra demands, but it seems to me that what we're witnessing is something that goes deeper than just very specific demands. I mean, one of the things that I've always been surprised about is an increasing sense of identity of being from Hong Kong which is not something I used to really think or perceive or see a decade ago. How is that sort of playing into this process? Yeah, I'm really glad that you actually used the term process because for a lot of people, we only see what happens today. And we see that, oh, for example, uh, last week I was on the panel with my colleagues and then so another colleague of, uh, from mainland China, she said that, you know, if Hong Kong people don't even see themselves as Chinese, you know, what is there to even talk about? 
what we have to <laughs> understand is that, so I belong to the generation, you can, I hate to admit my age, but if you look at me that, <laughs> when in, in 1997, when I was, you know, what received one of those calls, who, you know, what do you identify yourself with? I would say Hong Kong Chinese. And I still today would, call, would see myself as Hong Kong Chinese. But the, among people who are 30 years and younger, they actually really increasingly see themselves as Hong Kong people. We want to understand this trend. Because when we, when we see that this is a trend, that the people who, under who see themselves as uh, Hong Kong Chinese, over time, it's, this trend has been going down and down and down. And people who see themselves as Hong Kong people has been going up and up and up. What's driving so, that, though? So what's driving that? Uh, now, since that this is Harvard, so I can try to sound a bit more academic, <laughs> I actually have been teaching courses on uh, contentious politics and resistance movements and revolutions. And I use Tilly and Tarot, mm -hmm. and they talk about the political opportunity structure. Very often that when people protest, when people really, you know, they want to defend the things that they have. Um, some people will argue that people protest only because the opportunity structure seems to be widening, that the, the regime is making concessions, and therefore, you know, that it's safer to go protest. But at the same time, Till and Taro and all the, those scholars on contentious politics also tell us that what really drives people to go to the street is actually the very narrowing of the political opportunity structure mm. rather than the opening. And it's the threat. So why Hong Kong people today call that what they're doing is the last stand? So why the extradition bill is so um, insidious in a way because it really takes away the last firewall that protects Hong Kong from mainland China, eroding the difference between the H Hong Kong's judicial system and the mainland system. So people, anyone, not just Hong Kong people, anyone, including you, if you have, if the bill were to be pa were, were to mm -hmm. were to pass, then anyone, including you, if you just transit through the Hong Kong airport, if someone in Ch in, in China wants to indict you then they can take you away and they can freeze your assets if you happen to have mm. a, a, you know, a, a, an apartment in Hong yeah, Kong. Yeah, they won't go very far with my assets. But, uh, <laughs> so, you're, so you're saying there's really t two things related to that. One is a concern in Hong Kong about the effectiveness and transparency of the mainland legal system. But what you seem to be indicating is in a way this is a symbolic event because I think you refer it as a kind of a last stand that they see, you know, that should this go through or should this move ahead, is it because then they see other freedoms being encroached upon or how is this being interpreted? Right, there's another, so what, th this is the last stand, both in the sense that this is the last fire firewall, at the same time, this is the last firewall also because there have been an many other kinds of freedoms that have been eroded over time. We can talk about um, all the promises in the Joint Declaration, the British Joint Declaration of 1984, and also the Basic Law that Beijing promulgated in 1990. So, the, the rights to to have to to protest peacefully, mm -hmm. the rights to you, if you are arrested, the rights to have access to lawyers, the rights to contact your family members, and then the rights not to be beaten uh, and 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 have your bones broken when you are in detention center. All of those rights, actually, th these days they've been all been encroached, and then free p and also the free press. Now, p reporters, one one is that because so many of these uh, cases of arrests are live stream, and so there's so much evidence, and then we have international reporters, and very often then they're there on the scene. Mm. I just heard that there are many many reporters covering Hong Kong from the New York Times. The same with many other international media. S sometimes they get their own footage, but often that they get footage from Hong Kong citizens who just cir circulate their own videos uh, on, mm -hmm. uh, on social media. And you also have um, uh, reporters then, today they're also tear guests, they're directly tear guests. And they also are denied access to the site. They've been blocked, so then they, cover, mm. they can't cover what is going on. And, and the most important thing is, I would say, the last strand of freedom, freedom from fear. Today, when you go out, you wear black, and if you're a young person, you, there's some chance that you may actually just be beaten up by either the police or thugs. Uh, you, if you wear white, then other people may think that you are one of the thugs, and then they stare at you and, and probably yell at you. If you wear blue, you also that because the pro police protesters wear blue, and so you may also be seen as, as you know, one of those guys. So if you Every morning if you, before you go out, you actually even have to think about the color of the clothes you wear. You know, 
if even the freedom from fear is taken, taken mm. away from people, what's left? Let's come back to that again in a minute, because I think this question of freedom of fear is an important issue, which I hadn't really thought about before. Because in some ways, looking at outside, you could say, well, it looks as though you know, people in Hong Kong have more freedom now than they did, for example, when the British had uh, ruled Hong Kong. Uh, one can, you know, can question that. But that, that's an interesting part. I'd like to come back to that. But first, I'd really like to bring in Jane. Um, and what I thought we'd start with, with yourself, is that how have uh, the Beijing authorities been reporting these uh, demonstrations in Hong Kong? And as far as you can tell, uh, what has been their attitude towards them? And we've heard all kinds of alarmist stories that, you know, troops amassing in Shenzhen. Is this going to be a situation where, you know, the troops invade Hong Kong and so forth? But what is your take on this? Well, I'll just start with um, a very interesting lunch I had just before I left Beijing uh, um, this last month. Uh, it was a farewell lunch by a fairly senior official um, who's in charge of the information flow, and I thought it would just be a pleasant one hour, <laughs> but instead it ended up being four hours, <laughs> and a basically a lecture on how the United States is responsible for this chaos and these riots. And I said, oh, so what's the proof? And she said, oh, uh, Alan Weinstein. And I said, well, <laughs> Alan Weinstein's been dead for several years. <laughs> and she said, well, he was the head of the National Endowment for Democracy. And I said, well, what's that got to do with it? And she said, well, in 19, late 1991, he said that the National Endowment for Democracy is doing what the CIA used to do covertly. Ergo, National Endowment of Democracy in Hong Kong, so therefore it's responsible for what the Chinese see as the mess. So it was pretty hard to argue with this kind of logic. <laughs> um, but, but that's a familiar, I mean, <laughs> almost every instance where something goes wrong, it's either a handful of individuals who are up to no good, or it's foreigners instigating trouble, whether it's Americans, whether it's British, or whether it's Taiwanese, odd to call, odd to call Taiwanese foreigners when they claim it's an integral part of China, but still. So at first, uh, the Chinese uh, see the, the absolute golden standard, 7 p.m. CCTV broadcast totally ignored um, the protests uh, and went out and the authorities went to great lengths to uh, excise anything on WeChat or Weibo or on, on the protests. But when they turned violent, um, they used selective snippets to show uh, how this was really uh, very bad and how the Americans were involved in responsible for this violence. Um, and they've kept up that kind of uh, propaganda and Global Times, which some of you may know as being a very nationalist publication, goes out of its way to show um, the violence in the demonstrations. And I think they're very hard at work um, trying to show the American connection. Uh, just this morning, um, the Wall Street Journal broke a story about the arrest of a former U.S. fighter pilot, a former U.S. Air Force pilot, uh, who was flying for FedEx, and he was arrested a week ago uh, at the Guangzhou airport as he was flying back to his home in Hong Kong. And I think by making, and he's still detained, um, he was found to have some dummy pellets that work in some kind of dummy gun. That's not quite clear to me what it was, but it was certainly not real ammunition. But by selecting someone who works for an American corporation who is based in Hong Kong, they drive, they keep driving home that point. And in a way, they connect the trade war and Hong Kong because FedEx is involved in a problem with the trade war. So it's a very insistent message that the United States is involved in this. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's often, you know, been China's approach in these situations to stress economic development. And so we see, you know, with respect to Hong Kong, them saying, well, you know, you're destroying the economic potential for Hong Kong's future. 
Um, it's been an argument that they use in a number of areas that somehow you can develop away these kinds of challenges, ignoring culture, <coughs> individual approaches to things. But one other thing, Jane, I, I thought I noticed, and I thought it was interesting how you say there's an evolution from nothing to something. And I think that obviously that's created in part because you can't seal off China any longer. So information was coming back, and so there was a need to have some kind of response. I thought more recently uh, what was interesting in some Chinese publications was that they wanted to shift away from the fact there might be political demands to saying these are social problems in Hong Kong and that this is really um, about the problems of housing, it's about the problems of work, uh, rather than stressing that it might be a challenge to the way that uh, Beijing has been engaged in Hong Kong. Have you, see, have you seen well, this I or think heard that this at all? I think that's right, and they probably uh, change the focus because they think that the economic problems are something that they can help solve. Mm -hmm. So they're aware of the disparity between uh, the protesters and the rich pro-Beijing uh, uh, corporate titans in, in Hong Kong. So I th there seems to be some effort, I don't know the specifics, but to try and do s something about the, ho the poor housing in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And you know, the Chinese are very good at uh, doing rapid fixes on such mm -hmm. a thing. Well, it's one of the things the British did after the 60s, uh, you know, put in a lot of uh, low cost housing uh, to try and ameliorate some of the social problems that are broken up uh, during that period of time. Let's come back to, to some things that might be dealt with uh, in the future. Uh, Victoria, coming back to you, uh, I think it was in the New York Times that I saw a piece uh, which did talk about the inequalities in Hong Kong and the way that land was really important and the way that some of the, the major uh, real estate developers in Hong Kong had used land and the access to land, which had meant that there is this tremendous decline. So. Uh, is there a social dimension to these protests going taking place as well, yeah. beyond what you talked about earlier? Yes, definitely. So again, there's a very good, good um, great, wonderful New York Times story on the economic roots of the, the protest. Mm -hmm. I'm not taking any uh, ad money from New York Times. <laughs> 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 but, but because it's so important to see what the international media say about Hong Kong. Mm. Um, yes, there are economic roots, and the Gini coefficient in Hong Kong has been actually rising up to so point five something is very high and then it doesn't help that so uh, as we were chatting earlier and the, the other rumors that after 1997 actually Beijing has continued to use these tycoons to rule Hong Kong and y using the and allegiance so the buy, yeah buying <laughs> the loyalty and therefore people have been talking about collusion between the government and property developers for mm -hmm. all the, the, these years it's so it is true that the housing situation is really really bad and so on the surface of prosperity, then you know, the rich are very rich, but the poor become in, have become increasingly poor. But uh, one thing that's- Absolutely or relatively? Relatively. Mm. Okay. Uh, um, but then, you know, if rent, you, you don't make more money, but the rents just get higher and higher. Ah, okay. And so that's really difficult for many people. But another thing, so again, going back to you, the, your scholarship on contentious politics is that it often, it's, it doesn't make sense to separate E economic grievances from political gr grievances. Because it's one thing that, you know, I don't get a job and I see that I have no future. But it's not just about that. So now, the, uh, uh, Carrie Lam is going around saying that, okay, we're going to even take back some of these land from property tycoons. One of the, the motivations is because uh, Lee ka last week said oh, yeah. that, well, you know, we really have to be nicer, to be a little bit more tolerant of young people who are masters of um, Hong Kong's future. And then um, very, very almost immediately, one of the pro-Beijing uh, politicians in Hong Kong then called him the king of cockroaches because yeah. police officers are now calling Hong Kong protesters cockroaches. So calling, he, calling Li Kanshin the king of the cockroaches is not exactly you know, a, very, a, a compliment. And so then the, essentially the repercussions on these property tycoons are going to come, and so taking land from them. But the most important thing is that from, the s from scholarship, we know that it is actually the attribution. So if I don't get a job, if e economic in in inequalities are so high and getting worse and worse, and the rich are getting uh, richer, and I, my situation is so, so miserable, it's not enough that you improve 
my economic situation. You have the protesters attribute these economic problems to the political system. So the, what Till and Taro and all these other scholars would call the mechanism of attribution is very important. So already in, uh, during the umbrella movement of 2014, many people would say, oh, these young people, they're just really, you know, they're grumpy because they can get jobs, they can do this and mm. they can do that, and those pro the protesters tend to be losers. So what is also interesting is that we actually have a lot of professionals, people with very stable jobs, they make decent money, and also in the last few weeks that we also see the most elitist schools, even schools that you know the government officials actually come from, and they all form the human chains, and, mm. and they also stage the own class boycott. That we are not, you know, just trash of the society. So it's really about political grievances mm. that are the, uh, really at the root. I mean, one of the the things that really struck me was that the range of people that did participate in the demonstrations. Obviously, it was, it was a huge number. Uh, but it was a very broad cross-section of Hong Kong society. But does that mean that, in a sense, Beijing has lost Hong Kong? I think that is a good question. Uh, I would say that if you, essentially for a lot of people, Beijing has really lost the young generation. Mm. So as you said, uh, we said earlier, it's the trend about people identifying themselves as Ch Hong Kong people mm. only. That is important. And then at the same time, I think that everything has really gone much more downhill after these recent protests, because today a lot of people would just think that, you know, if I go down, uh, so, uh, there have uh, been a lot of arrests and confrontations, even just near residential areas, not the usual protest sites. And these people complain is that they just go downstairs to, to get something. Mm. And then they get in the middle of another confrontation and then they're beaten down, they're arrested and people get pretty upset. And so uh, the young generation, and you see that these uh, high school kids and even prime, uh, secondary school kids, high school kids and college students, they're all mobilizing. This entire generation, really Hong Kong's future, Hong Kong's future masters, they, Beijing has lost them. You're mm. right. So Jane, coming back to you, I, is there anything that Beijing can start doing from your perspective to regain uh, credibility in the situation? I mean, in some ways, it's been very restrained. Uh, it has been restrained because I think everybody's been sitting on the, in some respects, mm. because I think everybody's been sitting on the edge of the chair waiting for uh, Beijing to send in the troops. But as soon as this started, um, uh, people I spoke to in Beijing who advised the government said, they're going to be much cooler this time than they, than they were in 1989. It's a very different situation. Um, and I think the most interesting uh, barometer of that is the leaked tape of Carrie Lam uh, talking to business leaders in Hong Kong. And in this tape, she says, um, I think she uses three varies, very, very, very reluctant to send in the troops. <laughs> and that China still does care about its international image. Um, and in Beijing, they said, basically, it would only be at a very, very last resort. If they thought that uh, Hong Kong was lost in a bigger sense than what you're talking about, if they thought they'd lost the tycoons, they'd lost ty uh, Hong Kong as, as an economic entity, or in some really severe way, if they'd lost it, then they might consider it because it would be a very bad precedent, obviously, for Taiwan. They would not want to lose mm. uh, Hong Kong in that way. So, and they seem to think that time is on their side. They seem to think that they can do, ameliorate the housing situation, maybe do something about education, maybe do this, this, and that. Whether they can or not is another question, but I think they will think very hard. I think it'll have to be really drastic. And they, I think they feel that the demonstrations will kind of lose their impetus. They may be wrong, as you say, but that seems to be their strategy at the moment. Yeah, I mean, certainly riding out is one. As I, as I think I was saying earlier, I had thought that by now the demonstrations would be winding down, but clearly they haven't. I mean, I was on Taiwan uh, while the demonstrations uh, were taking place, and it was having a strong effect. You mm. know, Tsai Ing-wen's opinion 
ratings went up. Uh, a lot of people were watching very closely Hong Kong and uh, in many ways generating much more negative sentiments towards uh, what Beijing might offer or might not offer towards uh, reunification with Taiwan. So yes, certainly there's dramatic uh, ramifications. So is time on their side? Taiwan said time's on our side um, in terms of waiting for what might happen in Beijing. Who's side is Taiwan? Well, Taiwan, of course, has been really watching Hong Kong because if the one country, two system model doesn't mm -hmm. work in Hong Kong, it's also not going to work in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. But I also want to go back to the question, you know, if Beijing has been exercising restraint, I, I think we have to define restraints um, more broadly rather than so narrowly as just the deployment of the PLA, People's Liberation Army, or the PAP, the People's Armed Police. Mm -hmm. Because also in those, uh, it, it, Hong Kong and Macau and Affairs Office actually has held three three very rare press conferences ju just talking about Hong Kong. And then while they say that we do not want to deploy the PLA, they also say that we are standing behind the police. So mm. the police, essentially, I would say that there's been this very f increasingly bloody crackdown in Hong Kong. As we say, you know, you go down, you walk down to the street, if you, if you, if the somehow, and also that the police first would, issue, would refuse to issue the no objection permits to protest now. So if you still go, it means that you're involved in an unlawful assembly. And as such, then the police can just, you know, fire tear gas at you, uh, rubber bullets, sponge grenades at you, and arrest you and beat you with uh, batons. And I would have to say that, you know, a lot of people would say, you know, the protesters, they may deserve it. But, like, but, you know, even if we catch murderers on the spot, you know, suspect a murderer on the spot, you do not beat that person with batons to the point that they have bloody face. And then they also come out with brain bleeding and they have broken bones. It's really important that we, uh, for, for a lot of those images, we don't even know what happens inside police mm. station, uh, other than they come out uh, with all these severe injuries. And Hong Kong's medical staff, and you know, it takes many years to get your nursing degree, your doctor's degree, and these medical staff have been staging silent sit-ins with the banner, Hong Kong police attempts to kill, to murder Hong Kong citizens. And this is really important because this is an increasingly bloody crackdown. It's been getting worse and worse. The first time it, it, I was, as I would call it the bloody, the first bloody Sunday was August 11. It got worse on August 31st. And uh, with this situation, then you know, why do you send it? Why do you? Why you don't really need to send in the PLA? Um, and then another way I want to go to so I, I want, want to mention is the white terror. So we know about, for example, you know, threatening American citizens, people who work for American companies. But also in Hong Kong, we know that what is going on with Cathay Pacific. Essentially, mm. China has killed Cathay Pacific, Hong Kong's flagship airlines, by telling them that you either put, if you want to protect your employees' rights to protest, then you lose all your business. And so the CEO stepped down, and now. Uh, a lot of the uh, pilots and flight attendants, they would be confronted, uh, you know, are these messages yours? Is this your, your Facebook account? And if they say yes, and because they can't lie, and then they're fired immediately. And more recently, another, um, another league also says that Beijing really wants to adopt the Cathay Pacific model to other businesses and also using state-owned enterprises to take over a lot of Hong Kong businesses. So this is what Hong Kong people call a white terror, because as we said, all these professionals actually still want to exercise their professionalism. They still want to maintain their independence. Mm. We've seen civil servants, even civil servants, demonstrating, protesting. And so um, there's this fear that the, a lot of these people afterwards, if this actually gets ever calmed down, that there'll be this white terror blanketing Hong Kong. And why Beijing doesn't really want to use the PLA for a lot of people, this reason is simple. Beijing has reaped tons of uh, benefits from Hong Kong special status as a special customs entity. By sending in the PLA or PAP, then we basically just tell the whole world that Hong Kong really does not have two systems, essentially mm. the zero autonomy. I think Victoria yeah, I does have a point. I think that, um, I, I think the sort of the larger point is that China sees a way of squeezing Hong Kong economically and making it re revert it back to a little fishing village. Uh, and they think they can keep it under control that way rather than sending, doing a repeat of 1989. Well, there are plans now, the development plans for Shenzhen, which is clearly 
partly geared towards of trying course. to take some of those benefits back. You know, if I was sitting in Beijing, I would see this as a massive intelligence failure. I mean, I would be furious with my Hong Kong liaison office that why didn't you tell me that something like this was going to happen? I mean, I think they must have been shocked. I, I do want to open up for, for questions in a moment, but before we do that, just, just one last question I'd, I'd like to ask the two of you. To get to resolution, there has to be compromise on all sides. I, mean, I think one of the things we, we saw in Tiananmen in 1989 was that all sides were so firmly believed, uh, firmly uh, convinced that right was on their side that you got to a point where it was impossible to enter into serious dialogue. So before we open up, uh, do you think the potential is there and what steps might have to be taken? I Let's think it's pretty tough because um, the Chinese government is unhappy with this and they're nervous about it, but they've got a bigger, what they consider, I think, to be a bigger problem, which is the trade war with the United States. Mm. And I think also they are fortified in their stance with Hong Kong by what they see as the um, attitude of the Chinese public. You know, it, we have no polling information in, in China, obviously. Um, but just gauging from American educated uh, Chinese people, people who've been to university here, who run businesses in China, who are reasonable people, they look at this um, situation in Hong Kong as totally unjustified by the, China, by the Hong Kong people. They look at them as ungrateful citizens, uh, spoiled brats, and they should just get their own house in order, and they should be constructive t instead of destructive, to use their word. So I think, in a way, uh, the Chinese government feels it can take its time, and I think that sort of delays the idea of a compromise. I mean, there is a compromise which would be very easy for them, which is to let Carrie Lam actually step down, get a new police chief, mm. and start all over. But that's, I think, a tad too much loss of face. Mm -hmm. uh, and if they're not going to do that, then they're going to wait a while, I think. Mm. Victoria, what do you see? Yeah, so the second demand to have independent investigation is very, very important because the police abusers have just got worse and worse. And I was so would that, if, as Jane was saying, so if they switched out the police chief with a new police chief, would that be a point at which they could go to the Hong Kong public and say, okay, let's start? this investigation? Well, this would be the s same as just, you know, uh, Carrie Lam stepping down and using another person and the other person, would, if, if that's s the new person continues to be beholden to Beijing and just ca carrying on to whatever, essentially continue to have no autonomy, it would not work. And also that the problem is, it's not just about the, the police chief that's who is responsible. It is actually the entire system. Now we've seen actually police officers anon anonymously saying that we also support an uh, independent investigation. We also have seen family members saying that that is very important because now the police have become the enemies of Hong Kong citizens. And I want to emphasize that this really is new. We have to look at the process, how things have got to where we are today. When I was a little girl, my mother, every time that we went out, when I was a little girl, that she would be worried that I would get lost, and she would say, if you ever get lost, go get help from a police uncle, po police auntie. And that was the level of trust when I was little. And today, the police are seen as the enemies of the people. And it is very important to have independent investigation mm. rather than just changing the chief, because that is just mm -hmm. way too symbolic. Well, that might be something that, that Beijing could give up. I, I hope, I, I, mean I, I would say that in a way, uh, Beijing actually can really have a win-win situation, mm -hmm. is to just let Hong Kong be Hong Kong. Yeah, really honor the Sino-British Joint Declaration. Well, that was supposedly the, the deal. <laughs> <laughs> Hong Kong people are ruling Hong Kong. But I, I do <laughs> want to make sure that we've got time uh, for questions, so sorry to, to cut you off there. So we have a, a two mic. We have a microphone here, here, and I suspect there's ones up there. So uh, yes, yeah, go and line up at the microphone if you have a question to ask. Uh, let us know who you are, where you're from, and remember, a question ends with a question mark, preferably. <laughs> Gentleman here. Thanks. Uh, my name is Ian Chong. I'm a visiting Harvard Yenching scholar, um, and. 
my question actually goes back to the last point that was touched on, which is um, when we talk about the Sino-British joint agreement, what we've heard from Beijing also is that this agreement is no longer operative. Um, it, it is null, it is void. So what do we make, what should we make of this claim um, about the Sino-British agreement? How might it or might it not hmm. apply the Hong Kong si to the Hong Kong situation today? Excellent. I actually thought that there's contention about whether that they really have said and who has said it's no longer valid, but Victoria, you might be more Yeah, informed. already in 2014, people, or, uh, Beijing officials already said that oh, okay. the Sino-British Joint Declaration basically became void at the, at the handoff of Hong Kong on mm. July 1st, 1997. The thing, though, is that this is actually an international treaty. It was filed with the UN, and not just that, because in the, so again, I hate to tell people how old I am, but then in the <laughs> 1980s, I still remember I was a teenager, that Beijing leaders would go around, traveling around international capitals, telling all of those Western democracies that Hong Kong is going to be different. The only thing that's going to change is the change of flag. And everything in Hong Kong will stay the same. And so don't worry, the rule of law and, and you know, continue to have business in Hong Kong, continue to invest, everything is going to be great. And so it's actually in response to that, going back to American black hand, it was in response to Beijing's reassurances that then the US Congress enacted the, U the US Hong Kong Policy Act of 1992. And so you cannot complain about international monitoring today when you actually invite international <laughs> monitoring because you are giving people a you really cannot have it both ways. And if, you know, today you can say that one treaty is, n is now for, what about other treaties that you've signed? Okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, there hasn't been a lot of, uh, I would say, international pressure on Beijing around this. There's a gentleman here, please. Oh. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Jing, and uh, I'm a reporter from the Christian Science Monitor. Uh, my question is about China's uh, campaign to influence people's opinion on Twitter. So I just read a New York Times article on how the current campaign is relatively hastily put together and not very adept. But um, will there be a more sophisticated uh, campaign uh, coming up? And what would that look like? What should people watch for? Thank you. Hmm. Do we have any non-New York Times readers here? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Jane, do you? That's, I mean, that's kind of difficult. It was to a great story, to. and it was an exclusive, and it was, uh, it showed, uh, yeah, it showed that the Chinese are learning some tricks from the Russians, but they haven't quite gotten there yet. Um, <laughs> uh, I think it's impossible to know what's going to come. I do think it's interesting, though, that uh, Chinese officials overseas are now making greater use of things like Facebook and Twitter to put messages out. Uh, somewhat ironic given that they're banned uh, within China. So I do think that what we're going to see is probably a greater arsenal being used to sort of put out messages from Beijing. And we can be critical, but at certain times, I think the propaganda apparatus in Beijing can actually coordinate things pretty well to get out fairly consistent messages. But uh, uh, someone standing here, I can't really see you with the lights. Yes, please. Hi, I'm Selena. I'm an undergraduate at the college. So um, you guys have talked a lot about like the current state of Hong Kong and what it will be like in a couple of months. I was just wondering, what do you think Hong Kong will be like in maybe 10 years time? I think mm -hmm. the worst scenario is it'll be squeezed so badly economically that and that Cathay Pacific is maybe just is probably the first in a long line of big companies that are going to be squeezed and it could well become an irrelevant part of that part of the world. That's the worst case scenario. Yeah, I think there is a danger. I mean, if you're a foreign business and you think you might potentially be put in the situation about disciplining your own staff, you may begin to think seriously about where you want to headquarter uh, that business. Can I just add yeah, to that? Yeah, please. So this, another thing is, yes, because everyone knows that this is the worst uh, scenario, and if you have not watched the film 10 years, also, you know, go watch it. So precisely because people are so worried about the worst scenario, that Hong Kong will literally be just completely killed, um, as, you know, the Hong Kong that we grew up with, and this is why this, th this is the last stand, and people are not really going to give up. They're just going to keep protesting through many different means. Okay, um, is there someone on this microphone? No? Okay, then, yes, let's come back down here again. 
gentleman here, yes. please. Okay, hi, I'm Eric. I'm a first year at the college. I was just wondering, considering that um, mainland China does believe that there are U.S. influences in the democratic movement, what is the U.S.'s role here? Like, what should we do? And then with that, what should the international community as a whole do? Thank you. Thank you. I'm not a policymaker. I'm going to duck that one. <laughs> I'm a journalist. I can answer this question. Um, essentially... <laughs> No, not that I'm a U.S. policy. <laughs> not that I'm a U.S. policymaker. I'm not. I'm just a boring academic. But at the same time, though, we have seen that um, Hong Kong protesters, so Joshua Wong, Denise Ho, they have been actually just basically just spent this past week lobbying, meeting with congressmen. So they really want the U.S. Congress to pass the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act, and then. They are also lobbying European countries to do something similar. In a way that what I would like to say is that because the future looks so bleak, the worst scenario is so bleak, and in a way, there's really one country, two systems. Basically, it's more or less dead. The only way that standing between the to its total death and its further descent is that all of these Hong Kong people are brought, uh, it is across many sectors. Um, probably, ha I don't know how many, but then, you know, two million people show up on June 16th, and then all these different professional groups have all protested. And so, because these people all are all insisting on protecting the values that they've grown up with, and they're all trying to defend it. But at the same time, they know that they really cannot fight this battle on their own. So the big difference between the umbrella movements, when these Occupy leaders were very shy about getting international support, and today, they really are just going all out to get international support, and because they realize that they cannot fight this on their own. I think it's really important that it's also about values. Yes. From, from that. You know, Christine Lowe had talked about the silent majority, you know, coming to bridge the gap between the different communities. But when you say there were two million people turning out, I mean, it's difficult to know where that silent majority was in the middle. That's a huge number of people. I think we have, uh, is a lady up there? Yes, please. Yeah. Um, so I'm an East Asian Studies concentrator and inspiring journalist, and I was wondering, um, what do you think the role is of foreign media in covering events like this and photographing um, people involved in the protests? Um, how can sort of foreign journalists um, minimize the extent to which the government is able to paint international media as sort of strictly partisan and as not being real Hong Kong and not caring about real Hong Kong people? Well, I'll give you an anecdote about that. So at this four-hour lecture that I got just bef last month in Beijing, uh, this person said, well, you know, you and the foreign media, you just paint these protests as, uh, as, as peaceful protests. And I said, excuse me, the New York Times has been uh, meticulous in uh, describing and reporting um, everything that has gone on, and we've had to invest in masks and all kinds of gear to protect the reporters as they get closer and closer to the violence. And she looked at me just stunned. I said, well, haven't you read it in the New York Times? <laughs> and she said, no, I haven't read it in three months. So. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Yes, the gentleman here, please. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Ji Sang Hai. I'm the second year MPID student in HKS. Uh, first, I got a question for Victoria. And so who do you think uh, start the violence, like police or the like students uh, or the general public? And uh, the second is I want to rehearse, uh, like Jane just said, talk about the, the, you know, the phrase about China and Hong Kong. I think it's like, uh, may, you, maybe you should say the mainland China and Hong Kong because Hong Kong is always part of China. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me answer the question. I really appreciated the question that, you know, who started the violence, and at the same time also that I've also heard a lot of people saying that, you know, international media don't really depict the violence going on in Hong Kong. Other than that, it's like every weekend, I, I've been just been reading, you know, another day of violence confrontations, you know, whether it's New York Times, or Washington Post, or The Guardian, or the CNN. Um, but at the same time, we have to really see this as a process. So already on, as we said earlier, already on June 12th, when protesters surrounded the Legislative Council building so that, they, so that uh, the meeting had to be uh, postponed, canceled. 
at that time, protesters were actually not really doing much. They were just uh, circle, uh, encircling the, the Legislative Council. And then already the police used excessive uh, force. And feel free to take a look at the uh, video or, or, uh, reports that the New York Times compiled. And then another turning point was on July 1st. On July 1st, when protesters stormed into the Legislative Council building, and they vandalized it. And again, so then the next day, a lot of the international media all said basically vandalism and all, all of that. Mm. So it basically, they honestly depicted it. But what is really interesting is that for, they, there was one slogan that got, got really stuck among Hong Kong people. Whether they approve of the acts or not, it's you, Carrie Lam, who has taught us that peaceful protests do, do not work, do not have any impact. So they refer to, so one million people protested on June 9th, and two million people protested on June 16, and the government refused to formally withdraw the bill. Now, I am a person, I personally believe in nonviolence, and I've been trying to say that, actually, the more brutal the police have become, the more important that you actually avoid direct confrontation. And, but at the same time, for a lot of those people that they, for them, then they look at the police increasingly beating people and breaking the bones, and the, in the worst case, a nurse said that the one case in an X-ray showed that the person's wrist so broken that the only thing connecting the wrist is just the skin, no tendon, no, you know, no connected tendon, no connected bone. And in a way that the escalation, so also that I encourage you guys to really read the scholarship on contentious politics, read Tilly and Carroll, uh, and, and then in every single case that we see escalation over time, we see escalation, radicalization. I would also say that until very recently, it had never imagined, to, uh, I, it would never have occurred to me that, you know, one of these days that I would use Hong Kong as one of the cases. It's actually frightening. Mm. Yeah, it does seem now, though, the demonstrations seem to be falling into a pretty familiar pattern that you see in a lot of other cases, that in the day, they're very peaceful processes. And then as the evening goes on, you tend to get breakaway groups and they tend to get more aggressive and there tends to be more violence. And I, I don't really know how you deal with that because then that does create all kinds of questions of debate. Who, who started it, who stopped it, and, and so on. And I, it doesn't really do anybody any good right. in the end. I think there's uh, somebody, yes, please up here. Thanks. Hi, um, my name is Frances Hoy. Um, I'm a journalism student at Emerson. Um, minoring in political science. So I just, I'm just wondering, um, so in April, I wrote an article um, called I'm from Hong Kong, not China, and I was threatened by a lot of Chinese international students. And after that, um, like people in Hong Kong, um, people in Boston who are from Hong Kong also united um, to join a lot of rallies, um, but we encounter uh, counter protesters um, um, basically um, comprised of, you know, Chinese international students against our activism. And I just, I'm just wondering, like, what do you think how we can, like, um, open a conversation with Chinese international students who grow up in an environment um, that they don't have free access to internet and they don't have um, free, free freedom of press, they don't, know what's going on in the world. Um, they don't know the full picture. <laughs> well, I think... <laughs> and they, basically a lot of students, they grow up in China um, in an indoctrinated education. And it's very hard to open a conversation with them, um, especially for me. I was always threatened by Chinese international students at my school when I start to talk about Hong Kong. So I just want to you know, um, listen to, you know, the pa panelists about, like, what do you think, how, uh, as someone from Hong Kong, how we can talk to them um, in an intelligent manner. Well, is there any way that you can get your school to invite, uh, th you know, a, a panel like this, but a little larger, and have two people on each side and a very sophisticated panelists like Tony Sage, and you start, you start talking in a, in, a, in, in a forum. I mean, that seems to me to be not beyond the realm of reason. Mm. Yes. Yeah, I think it's horrible if you're being threatened. I actually think most of our, I don't know about Emerson, but most of the international students that I meet from China here are actually pretty well informed. And, you know, they have fairly strong views. 
so I don't, so I, so I'm not, I'm not denying the points you make. And it does, of course, become extremely contentious. And then I do think the thing, kind of things that Jane is talking about is important. I think it's very difficult, probably, for you as someone from Hong Kong, someone from China, easily to be able to come that, overcome that problem. So I think some kind of brokered conversation is probably the only way into that. Even if you finish up disagreeing, at least you can maybe bring to a point of civility, I would hope. Um, can I also answer this question? Yeah, we're getting a little short on time, but yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay, sorry. So, uh, so last week at Notre Dame, we actually had a panel like this, um, and then we have a professor of mainland origin, and I'm, I'm of Hong Kong origin. Um, we had a very civil conversation, and then afterwards, some mainland students just came to me and said, can I give you a hug? Uh, <laughs> that was really great. I, I can understand why you're so frustrated, you know, because you actually made it into the Washington Post and the New York Times, and then, you know, <laughs> it's because of your own personal experience, I would say that it is, it is true, it's very difficult to have conversation like this. But then this, I would say also that a lot of mainland students actually are sympathetic, but they do not really want to speak out. And even so if they're not sympathetic, why not have them on a panel and start yeah. talking? Yeah. And not only one panel, but say one every three weeks or one, one you know, two a month or what, whatever it <laughs> might be. So it's just not one one-off startling thing. Yeah, I think it has to be a continual uh, dialogue and engagement. Sorry. Um, I'm not saying like all of the Chinese international students are the same, but I'm just saying like a lot of the students here are trying, like sometimes when I start to talk to them, it's very hard um, to go into their mind and just open a dialogue because they have a mindset of Hong Kong is part of China and we don't get a ground to talk. and at that point, hate speech starts to come, and I just feel like freedom of speech doesn't, you know, protect hate speech and, like, threatening statement, and that's, you know, I shouldn't be here, like, none of the people from Hong Kong should be here listening to all those things, and we're not able to, you know, rebound that kind of, and I also want to make an announcement. Um, this Sunday, in front of the <laughs> City Hall Plaza, we will have a protest um, in support of Hong Kong's movement. So if you're supporting Hong Kong protester, please come through. Um, it's, at, it's starting at 3 in front of the City Hall Plaza. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm sure people can find their way to that. Uh, there's a gentleman there, please. Uh, hi, the, m my name's Andrew Young. I'm a mid-career student here at, the, at HKS. Um, I would agree with those who say that the root of the problem in Hong Kong is the lack of universal suffrage and, and responsible government. But I wonder if it's realistic to expect China to agree with, to that uh, so long as Hong Kong doesn't live up to its uh, obligations under Article 23 of the, of the basic law in, in, in enacting a national security law to protect uh, China's interests. Interesting. Well, the thing is that I, um, how exactly you want to implement Article 23, that's another matter. And at the same time that many people would, would like, to, because it was Beijing tried to tell Hong Kong to, Im to introduce Article 23 in, t in 2003, and the problem was not just the bill itself, but how the procedure of pushing through it. And I would say that, you know, democracy, genuine universal suffrage, this is actually a promise in the basic law, and you do not really violate all this, you know, Article 24 for this uh, 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 selection of the chief executive and Article 68 on the composition of the Legislative Council. It really does not make sense to violate these promises and then uh, keep pushing this further and further. Okay, gentleman here. Hi, uh, oh, whoa. Um, hi, I'm Justin. I'm from the college. I'm a sophomore at the college. I'm from Hong Kong. Um, I have a question. The title today is The Future of One Country, Two Systems. And we briefly touched on um, the more immediate future of how this current situation can be de-escalated. De but I'm more curious, I think maybe um, Jane, having been stationed in Beijing, you would have more understanding of what do you think uh, the long-term future or solution to this, cri cause to this crisis and also this underlying fundamental um, conflict between uh, Hong Kong identity and uh, what, I guess, Beijing has in mind for Hong Kong. So how do you see the future of Hong Kong playing out? Well, I think we just talked a little earlier, and I think the worst case scenario is that China will continue to squeeze it economically, and it will become less relevant as 
money flees Hong Kong and goes to Singapore or goes to Shanghai or goes other places. Um, it would seem, though, that there, there could be a solution if people are willing to compromise on each side, but I don't think the Beijing government is going to, com they're certainly not going to allow universal suffrage. That's out of the question. So, because it sets too, obviously, because it sets too much of a precedent for the, for the mainland. Uh, so there has to be some kind of um, discussion among people, you know, representatives of both sides of what kind of suffrage there can be. Um, that I see as, as, as and they have, to be step they have to be stepping stones. And maybe some people have to, I mean, it would be helpful, I suppose, if the Li Keshengs of the world and the other long entrenched uh, corporate powers tried to persuade Beijing that it's not in their interest to just keep squeezing Hong Kong because it's not in the interest of the corporate barons either. So if there would be some ma magic formula to get these pro-Beijing barons who have been profiting off Hong Kong for the last number of years to, to come around a little bit and try and forge a compromise, I would think that would be a path. This is a gentleman here, please. Hi, um, my name is Cameron. I am a practicing structural engineer. Um, I wanted to circle back to a, uh, the earlier discussion about continual escalation of um, Beijing's response to the Hong Kong protests, and obviously everyone in the global community um, immediately jumps to 1989, which is what you guys brought up. And I found it interesting, the idea of losing Hong Kong or something drastic would force Beijing's hand to um, send in the army. But at the same time, though, it's also, I wanna, I wanna ask what you guys think the difference between losing Hong Kong versus needing Hong Kong, because also another um, interesting points that you guys have been bringing up is that squeezing out Hong Kong so it becomes irrelevant. And if that's the case, then in a true sense of nihilism, what's the point of all this then? <laughs> Victoria? Yes, I think this is a very good question between losing Hong Kong and needing Hong Kong. And I think the reason why Hong Kong protesters are lobbying um, different governments to, to introduce, uh, um, to pass the EU, uh, Hong Kong Human Rights and Policy Act is so that, you know, maybe this is the way to strike a balance is that Hong Kong continue to have a special status, which allows Beijing to actually reap tons of profits. So I testify on, on September 4th, and then early on, on that same day, Victor Xi of U USC, he said that oh, just over the last five years, that Beijing actually raised one trillion US dollars from Hong Kong. And so Beijing has benefited so much from Hong Kong, so then the needing Hong Kong part, and versus losing Hong Kong. I just, I said earlier, it is actually a win-win situation. If Beijing understands that, you know, let go Hong Kong people, do not really want independence. They really want to defend the way of life, the freedoms that, that they've grown up with. They want to restore their, their freedom from fear. And let Hong Kong be Hong Kong, then it is win-win. Now, of course, it is a hard sell, but hopefully maybe one of these days that people actually can realize that. Okay. I think this may be the last question, but let's see. The lady up here. Hi, uh, my name is Miu. I'm a student at the college. Uh, throughout the panel, we've talked about conflict at different structural levels between Hong Kong and the mainland, between police and the people, and between the people themselves. So my question is, even before talking, addressing the need for negotiations um, between Hong Kong and the mainland, how do we begin to establish peaceful dialogue at more of the local level, uh, not between Hong Kong mainland, but person to person? Okay, why don't we do the following? If you have a quick question, the gentleman here and the lady here, and then we'll let our two panelists uh, wrap them up together, please. Okay, um, my name is Patrick, I'm a software engineer, and I'm also the, uh, one of the Hong Kong guests who live in Boston. And this, uh, the, last, uh, the latest news about the uh, FedEx pilot is detained in, at uh, China, the Guangzhou airport, accusing him of uh, carrying a gun. So that's the latest news about the, the Fed uh, pilot. So we know that there's uh, a lot of conflict be between the business uh, uh, with the Fed here with China. And so this silence terror is not really just impact to the, um, the Hong Kong 
localized business. Now it's now uh, spread to the American business. So this is a lot of influence to impact to the American people. So I just want to ask uh, the two of you, maybe three of you, if you travel to you, uh, China, are you afraid of speaking up with your opinions or afraid of detain as the pilot or they just carry something? Okay, thank you. And last, here okay, please. Thanks for your lecture. Uh, I'm the visiting fellow of HKS Ash Center and also a PhD student from the Tsinghua University. And I think the pre uh, condition we talk about the Hong Kong is on the basis of the concerts that the two systems, because uh, I think there's maybe a distortion of the understanding of the two systems. Uh, our basic law states very clearly that the two systems refers to the socialist system and the capitalist system. So when we talk about the Hong Kong issue, uh, such as the social uh, conflicts or the economic uh, declines, so should it be due to the over-engagement of Beijing or we consider it as the implementation of the capitalism? Thank you. Okay. So any last thoughts? Uh, I'll just ideas? answer the question about nervousness of uh, going to China. I think that uh, the Beijing government has to, has to think seriously about what they're doing in arresting people like the FedEx pilot uh, and detaining other people because it, it is a turnoff to business people, American diplomats, American officials, all kinds of people uh, are now reluctant to go to the mainland and this may be intentional or not intentional um, by the Beijing government. I suspect it's, they don't really want to stop the flow of international people going to, going to China. But yes, there is a lot of nervousness about, about going, which so wasn't present before. So the question about one country, two systems. And I think that um, you know the, the, the two systems are really defined by, by capitalism and socialism. That probably was what Beijing had in mind. But we have to keep in mind that what the Sino-British Joint Declaration actually says and also what the basic law really says. So go read it and then look at all the guarantees of freedom of speech, the rule of law, independence ju judiciary, and all of those guarantees. And a lot of these actually have now been utterly broken. And so, um, you know, it is what you, you cannot impose what you had in your mind when you signed this on the British Joint Declaration or promulgated the basic law that you really didn't mean those guarantees. So because if that's the case, then, you know, how can the rest of the world trust that, you, that all the other guarantees that you make? And then when it comes to the question about delegation, I mean, um, a dialogue and negotiation. So um, the, the chief executive, Carrie Lam, is opening dialogue in, um, in the community, with Hong Kong community. The problem is that it's, again, very little, very too late. And many people do, these days are actually fearful that if you voice any opinions, that you may actually suffer consequences afterwards. And some people also say that, well, yeah, you know, it is very difficult to compromise when this is a leaderless movement and you cannot really talk to anyone. There's no one to represent the opposition. Well, the thing is that the five demands are very, very clear. And I would also say, as we said earlier, that the second demand to have independent investigation into police abuses is really important. Repeated polls have shown that 70-some percent of Hong Kong population, the, the respondents, want to see that. Essentially, we have this very territory-wide demand. This has to really be implemented first, and then other things probably can, can be discussed in, in, in uh, secondary steps. Great. Okay, I want to thank everyone for a very civil uh, conversation, and please thank our panelists. Thank you.